Hello, I'm Professor Matthew Schmidt, and I'd like to welcome you back to genetics. We're continuing our discussion of gene expression and protein synthesis, and as if the other discussions we've been having weren't, as, weren't exciting enough, we're really getting to the part, and I'm being serious, that is the most exciting, at least I remember when I was a student, this sort of brought together things that we have discussed in so many different ways. We've talked about the structure and function of the gene from a lot of different perspectives, and now we're really at that point where the molecular underpinnings that really make it happen are going to be able to be understood. If you're following along in order, we've been talking about in this section uh, the central dogma and the fact that DNA is storing information in its base pair sequence and that a messenger RNA is being copied through transcription, um, ultimately that information is going to be brought out to be made into a protein. So the idea is not revolutionary. Beetle and Tatum said one gene, one enzyme, or one gene, one protein a while back. Now we're going to see how it literally and actually occurs. How does genotype, meaning the actual, in this context, meaning the actual sequence of bases in a DNA molecule, end up translating into phenotype, which means the actual amino acid sequence that creates a particular type of protein that does something. So before we get into the mechanics of it, we need to talk about the genetic code. So let's do that. Now, uh, you see here I wrote translation and the genetic code, the construction of a protein. This is our goal, if you will. We're going to take information that was in messenger RNA and use it to make a protein. And this process is called translation. Um, the reason it's called translation, perhaps obviously, is that we're changing languages here. Remember, copying DNA into RNA is transcription. That has the idea of just copying it. A scribe just copies. Now, it's not identical, but both DNA and RNA are speaking nucleic acid language, right? But now we need to translate that information, that language, into the language of proteins, which is using amino acids as its basic words or letters, depending how you look at it. So translation most normally, and I think we've said this before, is used to refer to the step whereby the, the information in messenger RNA is made into a protein. Some people, when they say protein synthesis, they mean this whole thing. But to me, protein synthesis is broader, and it means all of the steps, including transcription and translation getting you from the DNA information to the protein information. So let's recap a tiny bit here. When a mature messenger RNA has been released to the cytoplasm, so the implication here is that this would be happening in a eukaryote only because that was the last thing we were talking about. But whether bacteria or eukaryote, you have to have, I mean, there isn't a lot of uh, maturation and processing in prokaryotes as we've discussed, but one way or the other, we're going to have a messenger RNA that's, quote, ready to go in either case. And the same goes for tRNAs and ribosomal RNAs. We need all of these in order to actually get the protein synthesis going. We'll talk about the mechanics in the next part. But remember that ribosomal subunits actually start getting put together in the nucleus and that all that transcription of ribosomal RNAs is actually what the nucleolus or nucleolus actually is. Ribosomes, remember, have two subunits, a large one and a small one. In bacteria, they're 30S and 50S. Remember that S for sedimentation coefficient. We talked in an earlier uh, lecture, or I should say theory session, about 16S ribosomal RNAs, etc. So when they're all put together, you get subunits with this. They're put together with proteins as well, ribosomal proteins. You get subunits of these sizes, one small, one large, OK? But I don't know if the word philosophical is the right word. But the whole point of this theory session is to think, and I can't be a positive, but I think scientists of the day, before they really had the hard experimental facts, they were thinking about it. Remember, Watson and Crick really didn't do a lot of experiments. They thought about using data that people had. What would make sense in terms of DNA structure, just as one example? So before 
we start doing smart experiments, we have to think about the genetic code in this case. Because from everything we know, and when I say we, I mean both we in this class, but also scientists up to this point, probably in the late 1960s, the idea of a genetic code, I say, is implicit because we've sort of said this, but what I mean is somehow we know information has to be converted from nucleotide language, which DNA and RNA speak, to amino acid language. And that's the idea of translation, as we've said. So let's just think about this. In any code, guys, a language is a code. A code can be so many different forms. But by the definition of a code, one or more symbols, whether that symbol is literally one symbol or a word or a picture or whatever it is, one or more symbols in one language have to represent a corresponding symbol in the other language somehow. If you're translating English to French, it's not a great analogy, but, you know, we know, maybe you speak French, but uh, a chair, I point at it, you go, yeah, chair. In France, they say chaise, I think. Um, in other words, we're referring to the same thing, but there's one word for it in one language and one in the other. Not the best example, but you get the idea. So somehow, there's the bottom line. There are four nucleotides in the nucleotide language. Because remember, what they really are, are A, G, uh, C, and U, because it's the RNA that's going to be directly translated. But 20 amino acids, there are 20, and there are, necess there are necessarily 20, they have to be specified. So you can clearly see, we're going to talk about this for a minute, it can't just be a one-to-one -one correspondence, but no one said it was. I mean, at this point, this is what's fascinating about it. However this code came into being, which is a much more philosophical discussion, uh, imagine the excitement of trying to figure this out and having the tools to do it. So here's a table that I think if you feel like um, I'm just babbling and you're getting lost, I hope you don't feel that way. But here's something to ground us, okay? Because look, here's a table that shows if we're just doing a thought experiment now, we're saying, look, if it were true that the number of bases in the genetic code that specified one amino acid was, in this case, one. I hope it makes sense to you that the maximum, the exact number of amino acids that you could specify would be four, right? Because there's four different nucleotides. So this would mean, it's not correct, but it would mean, say, A means methionine, G means aspartic acid, whatever it is. Uh, you'd be able to specify four if there was a direct one-to-one -one ratio here. That's not happening. You don't have to do any experiment to realize, you know, that that's not feasible. It's not reasonable. So they started to think, well, what if it's a doublet code? A doublet code, which I'll write here, would mean that a pair of nucleotides would act as a unit in specifying one amino acid. So, for example... AA would be one doublet, which would mean something. AU might be another doublet that would mean something. It probably doesn't take a lot of math skills, no offense if you're not great at math, to realize that if you did it that way, there would be 16 different combinations of four nucleotides arranged into pairs, each of which act as a unit. There's a formula for this, actually, if you want to remember it. It's 2 to the n, and what that means is where n equals number of bases acting as a unit. So if you just want to make sure we did our math right, when one base is acting as a unit, 2 to the 1 equals, I'm sorry, I messed it up, didn't I? Rather than start all over, we'll just say, uh, apologize, and it's not 2 to the n, it's 4 to the n. I'm sorry about that. So if n equals the number of bases, 4 to the n, 4 to the n where n is 1, I really apologize for that confusion. Um, but 4 to the 1 is 4, right? So that's where we get this from. 4 to the second power, which is 4 times 4, is 16. <laughs>